All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy Tuesday. Um, this is our last week. Can't believe it. Um, from where we started to where we are now. Um, it's been quite a journey. Hopefully you guys have got have uh, learned a lot from the class. Um, and hopefully we've done a good job at kind of getting the information out there, being available for you guys as much as we can. Um, always welcome to feedback, because we're gonna be doing this same thing again in the fall. Hopefully that'll be the last time. Um, and then we'll go back to some sense of normalcy. Um, let's see what else. Um, couple things actually. So let's go back to the other screen. Um, so plan for this week, our final week, is today I'm going to go over reproduction two. Um, there's quite a few slides on it. I want to kind of, well, I really want to take my time going through it. So I've decided instead of having the actual exam review where we go over the study guide in class um, or on Zoom, I'm, I'm going to do that separately, the review, and then just go over the study guide and then um, record that and then send you the link. Um, hopefully that'll work for you. Thursday is our lecture exam. Um, and there was a couple people were confused about when's lecture seven. Um, I think I put it on, yeah, I did put it on the syllabus, but just to kind of hopefully overcome any confusion is that because the last exam is worth 100 points, basically I've taken two, it's equivalent to two exams. Um, it is one exam, so it's just, it's going to be uh, all reproductive. So um, pretty focused, but of course a lot of information. It'll be exclusively uh, multiple choice, as well as I will incorporate some true-false questions. Um, there won't be any essays or anything like that. So that's kind of the plan. Um, I should have your final grades by Monday, June 1st, um, and that's dependent upon getting everything from Robin. I know she's been putting, posting everything online. Um, don't forget also, Thursday is the last day for those of you guys that haven't done it yet to submit your extra credit. Um, potential for 10 extra credit points between the COVID um, video kind of reporting on that as well as the um, different cell transport mechanisms that were discussed in the um, cystic fibrosis video. All right, so that's pretty much that. Um, just kind of a, a little sideline um, note. This summer I am going to be teaching, actually we start this week, <laughs> actually today, um, at SDSU. I'm teaching an animal physiology class. Um, so if anyone is interested, um, I'm going to be posting videos for those lectures online as well. Much of it will be review from what you covered, but it kind of has a neat slant in the sense that starting uh, later in the week, we'll be going over comparative animal physiology, the difference between animal lungs versus, or mammalian lungs versus um, fish gills, how animals deal with oxygen differently, how animals deal with temperature differently, solute levels. Um, so I was gonna say, if you're at SDSU, stop by, but since I'm not gonna be there, no one will be there, um, feel free, it'll be the same uh, YouTube channel um, and I think you guys should have access to it if you're interested. All right, um, so let's go ahead and get started here. Um, and share. Looks like we've got quite a few people here, which is great. And again, feel free to stop me at any time if you've got any questions. I'm just gonna do one last check just to make sure I am recording. Yes, I am. Okay. 
Okay, so we're covering the second part of the reproductive system. Those of you guys that are also in my anatomy class, you'll find that this lecture is pretty close, probably about 90, 95% similar. So if you start nodding off, you still have the ones from anatomy, but I will go into a little bit more mechanisms, physiology um, in this one. All right, so female reproductive system, and there's gonna be, I'll try to discuss some of the parallels between male and female, um, and obviously a lot of the structural differences. But as far as the similarities, the, the much like the male reproductive system, it's one of its functions is designed to manufacture gametes, such as sperm. In females, it's similar. The, the function of the reproductive system is to manufacture gametes, in this case, ovum or eggs. Um, in addition to that, of course, structures in the reproductive tract are uh, designed or structured to be able to support the developing embryo. So we'll be taking a look at different structures and what their roles are in the reproductive cycle. Um, different from male reproduction, where a lot of most functions are pretty much consistent once puberty occurs, spermatogenesis and things like that. Um, female, there's a lot of cyclical changes that occur um, from month to month. It's what's called the menstrual cycle. And the structures of the reproductive system undergo changes. Um, and it basically affects all reproductive, all reproductive organs. Um, we're gonna be talking about changes in the ovary during the menstrual cycle. We'll be talking about changes in what we call the, uh, well, the, uter the uterus, which is this structure. Um, the uterine tube, otherwise known as the fallopian tube and the vagina. So we'll be going over each of the different organs, much like we did in the male, learn a bit about their structures, um, then we'll come back and take a look at their specific functions. All right, so this is a more of a close-up sagittal view of the female reproductive system. And you can see the structures, the ovary, obviously, of course, there's two of them. Um, here we have the fallopian or the uterine tube, whose main function is to transport the egg, eggs in, during the cycle that are ovulated, that are released, and they're transported much like the vas deferens in the male reproductive tract. From the uterine tube, we reach this very muscular organ, the uterus. And then, of course, we have the vagina and the clitoris. All right, so we're gonna start first with the organ that's involved in producing gametes, and that would be the ovaries. Microscopically looking at the ovaries, and we'll look at the big picture as well. Within the ovaries, we have structures that are known as follicles. Um, talking about the endocrine system, remember we spoke about follicles of the thyroid gland, which consists of follicular cells that surround this colloid. Well, in this case, the follicles consist of many small cells. These are all nuclei called cells that surround and protect an egg. This is what's called an oocyte. We'll talk about this. Now, one of the things we'll look at as well and you'll see this on some of the slides, is that the follicles that you see in an ovary are not, do not all look the same. There are some very small ones and there's very some very large ones. And the size of those eggs, uh, so the size of those follicles, um, has to do with the stage of development during the menstrual cycle. So we'll talk about those. A follicle that's very large, um, is involved in the process of ovulation in the sense that this egg is discharged from the follicle and that egg, which is this right here, is released into the fallopian tubes. So we have many of these what we call follicles. Now just to give you a bit of background on the anatomy of a follicle, not all follicles look the same. 
Um, we have what we call primordial follicles, and you'll see these primary follicles, secondary follicles that differ based upon the stage of development. This happens to be kind of a generic picture of a secondary follicle, but you could just apply this to really any follicle. Um, here we have the egg. Surrounding the egg is this layer that's kind of delineated by this arrow called the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is significant because it's the last barrier a sperm has to pass through to fertilize the egg. And we'll talk about certain strategies that the sperm have that enable it to pass through it. Outside the zona pellucida, we have several um, follicular cells. Now these follicular cells are divided up into two categories. This layer that you can see right in there, that's known as the granulosa layer. And we'll take a look and find out what they do. Basically, they're involved in producing hormones, uh, the reproductive hormones that you've heard about. Outside of that is this different layer, which is known as the theca layer. And that's also involved in producing a different set of hormones. All right, so speaking of the ovaries, once again, let's take a look at more of a frontal view. If you take a look at all the structures of the reproductive tract, um, we've got the uterus, the vagina, the fallopian tube, and the egg. Um, one of the things that we've learned from looking at the digestive tract and the lungs, but especially the digestive tract, is those organs need to be supported. Um, if you think about it, they could just kind of flop around. They need to be anchored to something. Remember with the um, organs of the digestive tract, we have the peritoneum, the serous membranes that help to support them. Um, the pleural membranes help to support the lungs. In the case of the reproductive tract, we have ligaments. And several that I want to mention here that help to support the ovary, we have what's called the ovarian ligaments which you can see right here. We have the suspensory ligament up here. Now it's on both sides, but we're just showing this one right here is the ovarian ligament, which is that. Here we have the suspensory ligament. And then we have what's called the broad ligament that encompasses this entire area. Um, these are very important for supporting the, the stability of the reproductive tract. Much like the male reproductive tract, um, we have a good vascular supply. Remember we spoke about the testicular arteries. Well, the ovaries are supplied by what's called the ovarian, ovarian arteries. Um, and we also have ovarian veins. But we have the ovarian arteries that nourish the ovaries. And much like the male reproductive tract, the neural supply is um, autonomic, both sympathetic and parasympathetic. All right, so now let's zoom into the ovary. Um, one of the things we know about the ovary is, first of all, this is an example of an ovary, the histology of it. One of the things that's clear from the beginning is that we have an outer membrane or an outer capsule called the tunica albuginea. This covers the ovary. It's very fibrous. Underneath that, we have two different regions, much like with the adrenal gland where we have a cortex on the outside and a medulla on the inside, which is also like the kidney as well, same thing is true here. The, the cortex is where we find most of the very small, immature follicles. Um, you can't see all of them here, they're very small, but we have primary, secondary follicles. These are, of course, the cells that surround a um, oocyte. That's the cortex. In the medulla is where we have, you can't see it very well here, we have a lot of blood vessels and some nerves, as well as some of the larger follicles. But it's mostly blood vessels and nerves. 
whereas most of the follicles are located in the cortex. Now, just for kind of a, get you familiar with some of the names, the egg that's contained within the follicles at this point is called an oocyte, specifically a primary oocyte. All right. So like I, like I said, we're going to jump from one region to the next, and then we'll come back and look at some of the specific functions. Moving from the ovary, we now go into the uterine tubes or the fallopian tubes. And their main function is to, well, two main functions. One is to transport an ovulated egg to the uterus. So remember with the vas deferens, we have this very muscular organ that helped to that would contract and move the sperm into the pelvic cavity during ejaculation. In the case here, we have a lot of smooth muscle that helps to move the uh, egg to the uterus. It takes probably about four or five days. But in addition to that, we have a layer of epithelium, a simple columnar epithelium that is also ciliated. If you remember the cilia of the respiratory tract, right, the function was to move mucus and dirty particles back up, right, back up where it can be expectorated. In this case, the, the purpose of the cilia is to move the egg. So that's one of the main functions is transport. It's also the site for fertilization. So normally when an egg is fertilized, so let me go back for a second, it's for, the sperm reaches the egg and fertilizes it in the uterine tube. <clears throat> the uterine tubes are divided up into several regions. Um, the region that's next to the ovary is known as the infundibulum. Actually, it shows it better here. It's the infundibulum. And this contains these finger-like projections. I don't know if you see these that kind of wrap around the ovary. The, when the egg is ejected during ovulation, it's picked up by these finger-like projections called fimbria, which help to move it along through the infundibulum. From the infundibulum, we then move into the ampulla, and the ampulla is the site for fertilization. That's normally where it occurs. From the ampulla, the fertilized egg now moves down through the, what's called the, the isthmus, which is this narrow area. Anytime you hear the term isthmus in physiology or anatomy, it's referring to kind of a narrow part of, in this case, this is the isthmus of the uterus, right? Um, this is the isthmus. If you think of even like an, an island, if you ever go to Catalina, there's a region called the Isthmus, which is like this narrow passageway. All right, so here's kind of a larger view of it, of several things. First of all, here's our ovary. Here's the infundibulum with the fimbria. Here is the ampulla. Here is the Isthmus, right? And then the next region we're going to take a look at is the uterus. And this is kind of a general view of it. You can see these different parts, which we'll talk about in just a second. This is a photomicrograph of the uterine tube. Um, with, this is the lumen, of course. Um, this is the ciliated epithelium, simple columnar ciliated. And we also have this muscular layer often called a muscularis, but it's essentially just smooth muscle. All right. Now let's move into the uterus. Um, the uterus, structurally or position-wise, it's often in what's called an antiverted position. Um, it's basically anterior in front of the rectum, posterior to the bladder. That's the normal positioning of it. Occasionally, in some individuals, the um, uterus can become everted or um, positioned differently, which can cause some difficulties. <clears throat> so what do we know about the uterus? Well, we already know, like I mentioned, that it it's actually helps to support an embryo, but, but region-wise. 
the uterus is divided primarily into three main parts. This region up here, which really is where the, uh, is the receiving portion of the fundus, of the uterus, I should say, from the fallopian tube, this is called the fundus. You remember the fundus of the stomach, which is right next to the esophagus. This area here is the body, which is the bulk of the uterus. In this area down here, although often it's referred to in, in a, as a separate name, but it's part of the uterus, and that's the cervix. This is sometimes called the neck. Now, what the structures that we've looked at thus far, the uterus and, for example, the ovaries, they undergo cyclical changes, and we'll talk about that shortly. The cervix uh, does also undergo cyclical changes, but its changes involve the production of mucus. Um, the consistency of the mucus varies depending on the stage of the menstrual cycle. Very thin during the fertile periods, very thick during the non-fertile periods. It's also responsible for producing what's called a mucus plug, which is very important during pregnancy, um, to help, which essentially protects the developing embryo and fetus from any influx of pathogens from the outside. Within the cervix, or this canal is known as the cervical canal, and it's bounded by two regions. The entrance into the cervical canal is known as the internal os, and the exit portion of the cervix is known as the external os, which leads right into the vagina whereas the internal os is just adjacent to the uterine cavity. Again, feel free to stop me at any time. <clears throat> All right, so those are the regions. Now let's do a little bit of histology. Um, obviously, uh, we've done a fair amount of histology in, this, in our class, um, so it's important to know the histology of the uterus because some of the, the functional features of it are dependent upon histology. Um, so let's take a look at this area in the body, and it can easily apply to the fundus as well, or even in the cervix. Um, there's three histological layers. The outer layer, uh, like the capsule portion of the uterus, is known as the parametrium. This is not any different than the peritoneum, one of the serous layers of the peritoneum that helps to kind of cover. Underneath that, or closer to the lumen, we have this thick layer. It's the thickest of the three layers, is the myometrium. The prefix myo, of course, means muscle. This is, consists of a lot of smooth muscle that has two main functions. The principal function is this, this is the muscle that contracts during the onset of labor, during childbirth. But it also has a secondary function in the sense that there's smaller contractions that help to guide or move sperm up towards the fallopian tubes where potentially fertilizing an egg. So it's very muscular. Lastly, is the endometrium, and this is really the layer that undergoes the major part of the cyclical changes. So the myometrium doesn't change much during the cycle or the parametrium, it's the endometrium. And the endometrium consists of a simple columnar epithelium that grows during the cycle, and then it's eventually shed during menstruation. And I'll talk about what is responsible for that, what governs that, um, those changes. All right. This is a photomicrograph showing the endometrium. When you can see this boundary, this is endometrium and this is myometrium. Um, one thing I want to mention to you, first of all, and this is very important, is the endometrium is divided up into two main regions. You can't really see the difference, but I'm just going to kind of randomly put a line there. To the right, closer to the lumen, is what's called the functionalis, or the functional layer. And the layer to the left, 
which is close to the myometrium is the basalis or the stratum basalis. So why do we divide these in into two? Well, during the menstrual cycle, and we'll go over this a fair amount, is there's changes in the growth of the endometrium. The area that grows is the functionalis. The area that shed during menstruation is the functionalis. The basalis stays there, it doesn't change. This is very important because if the entire endometrium was shed during the, in the menstrual flow, there wouldn't be any opportunity for new cells to develop. So much like with spermatogenesis, remember with spermatogonium, that some of the spermatogonium divide to form spermatocytes, but some of them divide to form more spermatogonium to keep that pool. In this case, we need to keep the basalis. Um, this, of course, is the myometrium. One of the things we're going to look at later is if an egg is fertilized, um, one of the, the, and the, uh, once the egg is fertilized, the embryo moves down, and implantation or the, the development of the fetus, embryo and fetus, takes place in this area when the embryo is actually burrowed in the endometrium where it's really housed there. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the vascularization of the uterus because it plays a fundamental role during the menstrual cycle. Um, the main blood supply, of course, is the uterine artery. That's the main one that travels towards the uterus, but it branches before it reaches the tissue layers. It branches first into what's called the arcuate artery, then into what's known as the radial artery, into the straight arteries, but finally, and the one that I want to really emphasize a lot is this coiled artery. These are what are called the spiral arteries. These are the arteries that, as you can see, are supplying the endometrium. This is all endometrium. During the growth part of the menstrual cycle, these blood vessels are very large and blood is de delivered to this layer very well to stimulate growth. Just prior to menstruation, these, these blood vessels constrict. And when they constrict, as you know with blood supply, this is going to affect the tissue and the tissue starts to die. It would be primarily this upper area, right? The functionalis. Um, it would die. And then what happens eventually is the blood vessel will rupture and this will carry out this dead tissue during menstruation. And then the cycle starts all over again. So I just kind of wanted to point that out as far as the significance of the spiral arteries. And we'll talk about them more as we go. Another reason I wanted to talk about the blood vessels is there's a type of treatment that's used for someone who's afflicted with uterine fibroids. Um, uterine fibroids, some of you may have had them yourself, some of you may have know of somebody who's had them. Um, they're not that uncommon. Um, I don't want to say they're frequent, but they're not that unusual. These are tumors that affect the uterus. They're benign tumors so that they're not cancerous, but even though they're not cancerous, they become extremely problematic. Um, it can cause a lot of abnormal bleeding during the, the menstrual flow. It can, it can affect fertility, um, the ability to get pregnant. It can also affect implantation of a fertilized egg. Tumors, this tumor, just like any tumor, because it's growing so rapidly, it requires a very good blood supply. So one type of treatment that's been found effective to um, dissolve these tumors is what's called uterine fibroid embolization, where a catheter is inserted through the femoral artery, eventually reaching the uterine artery, where plastic particles are injected. And I know this doesn't sound too good, injecting plastic into the body, but these are plastic particles that block the blood flow to the fibroids, eventually causing them to degenerate, and in some cases completely disappear. Um, the plastic particles are eventually broken down and excreted. 
so it's not like they accumulate in the body, at least that's from what I've heard. So this is one method. There are other methods for treatment. Um, um, certain medication can sometimes dissolve a tumor, um, sometimes actual surgery, where, which is a bit more invasive, where the tumors are removed. But this is actually an interesting approach that can be somewhat effective. Very effective, actually. Okay. Last of the reproductive structures I want to talk about is the vagina. Um, the vagina is known as the birth canal. Um, it also receives the penis during intercourse. Just by the nature of where it's located and the fact that it has to go undergo enlargement during childbirth, um, in order for it to enlarge, there are rugae in the vagina, much like rugae in the stomach. Um, and then remember with the rugae of the stomach, it allows the stomach to expand or enlarge um, and to allow for mixing of food. In this case, the rugae or these folds, I don't know if you can see them on this picture right here. They're these ridges. These are these transverse folds that allow the vagina to enlarge. Some other features of the vagina that are, that are uh, well suited for its, its function is the epithelium is stratified squamous, non-keratinized. If you remember, stratified squamous is a protective type of epithelium, right? We have it well keratinized on the skin, but we also have non-keratinized in areas such as the esophagus, as well as the anal canal, right? Areas that are under areas where the, the um, tissue can be exposed to abrasive, abrasive materials. Same thing is true here. So we have this non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium with a lot of underlying smooth muscle. Okay, so that takes us through all the different structures. Now I wanna go through at some of the main physiological processes that are occurring. And what I wanna talk about now is the process known as oogenesis. Um, it's the female counterpart of spermatogenesis. Some aspects are the same. There's one round of mitosis and two rounds of meiosis until we get to the mature gamete, in this case, the ovum. The difference, however, is with the male, remember it, it essentially is continuous nonstop from a spermatogonium to a, sperma, to a spermatozoa. It takes about 70, 75 days, and it starts at puberty. With females, um, first of all, it doesn't start at puberty. It starts when a female is a fetus inside her mother, and those fetal ovaries start undergoing oogenesis. In this case, there are millions of oogonium that start to undergo mitosis to form what are known as the primary oocyte. Remember, we spoke about primary oocytes that are contained within those follicles. Um, that primary o those primary oocytes will be the eggs that you see in the ovary, right? In order to uh, develop into a secondary oocyte, that primary oocyte has to be ovulated. Well, right around the time of ovulation, that primary oocyte undergoes meiosis one to form a secondary oocyte. So if you take a look here, here is the primary oogonium primary oocyte into, I mean, oogonium primary oocyte, which stays right up until the egg is ovulated. And of course, when does ovulation occur? Ovulation, at least the first ovulation, occurs at puberty. So if you think about it, with millions of primary oocytes, right, and typically only one oocyte ovulating per month, over the course of a reproductive lifespan, which everyone's different, but imagine maybe anywhere from 30 to 40 years, a lot of those primary oocytes will stay as primary oocytes. They're, they're in the ovary. They will never become a secondary oocyte. Um, the ones that do, of course, they're ovulated. The, and then the second meiotic division does not occur unless that secondary oocyte 
is fertilized. So it's a bit more tightly regulated. It's all these little checkpoints, right? You have all these primary oocytes. Is it gonna ovulate? Meiosis occurs. Is that ovulated egg fertilized? Second meiotic division occurs, or is it so very and very different, very tightly regulated? So, like I mentioned, all the oocytes that you're going to see inside an ovary are primary oocytes, right? And they're going to be contained with different sized follicles. Okay. So now we're going to jump into the details of the menstrual cycle, which will take up a good portion of the of the class. Um, of course, the menstrual cycle is a month, monthly event that's primarily dictated by hormonal changes that affect two main organs. I know we spoke about four, right? We spoke about the ovaries, the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. The two main organs that are really undergo or greatly influenced are the ovaries. And during the cycle, of course, that's when we see development of the follicles. And then there's also changes in the uterus that are occurring. We call this the uterine cycle, in which the, uter the endometrium undergoes changes, preparing it for implantation. It's all menstrual cycle, but I'm just dividing it up into two parts. Okay, so let's first take a look at the ovarian cycle. So again, remember, this doesn't start until puberty, right? Remember, in the ovary, prior to puberty, we've got all sorts of, of um, follicles, right? They're all containing primary oocytes, right? We can take the ovarian cycle, divide it up into two parts by really drawing a line straight across like this. This upper part involves events that are associated with the follicular phase. I'll explain what that means. This is where these small follicles that are containing the oocytes start maturing and getting bigger and bigger, still the primary oocyte getting bigger and bigger. Eventually, we reach the point, roughly around day 14, if you think of a typical menstrual cycle, I know it varies, but roughly 28 days, right around day 14, ovulation occurs. Once that oocyte, it's ovulated, now it's called a secondary oocyte, right? All these follicular cells, remember theca granulosa follicular cells, they transform into a new structure called the corpus luteum, which literally means, those of you guys that know Latin based languages, stands for a yellow body, and you can see it's yellow. Um, this starts to produce progesterone. Now let me back up for a second. The follicular phase is primarily under the influence of estrogen. The luteal phase is primarily under the influence of progesterone. Now, if we think about the, the um, transport and the sequence of events, say an egg is ovulated, travels down the uterine tube, right? If it's if it's fertile, well, whether or not it's fertilized, this corpus luteum is producing progesterone. Progesterone enters into the blood, and as we'll soon see, helps to build up the uterus. Now, the estrogen does too, but it's progesterone has the primary effect, building up the uterus, kind of creating, I guess for lack of a better word, like a nice little thick pillow for a fertilized egg, if it is going to be fertilized, can land on and develop. If fertilization does not occur, that corpus luteum will shrink, progesterone levels will drop, and then the menstruation occurs and the cycle starts all over again. Okay, so just divide these into two. Follicular phase up on top, luteal phase down here in between is ovulation. And we're going to put a lot of this stuff together, combining the different phases so you can see. All right. So just to kind of give you an idea of what's happening with the, with the follicular phase, um, the follicles grow, right? Initially, we have primary fo primordial follicles. During the course of the first 14 days, the primordial follicles develop into primary follicles. 
Um, and this is under the influence primarily of the hormone FSH. And this is where the name comes from, follicle stimulating hormone. Remember in males, FSH stimulates the Sertoli cells important in spermatogenesis, right? Here we're looking at FSH stimulating the growth of the follicles, primary, secondary follicles. You can see we still have the oocyte, but the follicles getting bigger and bigger, getting thicker. Here we have the theca and the granulosa cells. Eventually, we reach the most mature phase, which is either called, some people call it a mature follicle. I like to call it the graphene follicle. That's how I grew up, knowing it as that name. Um, and then, of course, this is the last stage prior to ovulation. So during the 14 days, roughly, this primary oocyte is being nourished and protected by these growing cells. And of course, not all of the primordial follicles grow, right? Typically, if you think of millions of primordial, primordial follicles, um, only a handful are going to start to develop. And typically, of those, the handful, only maybe one or two might reach maturity. All right. So let's zero in a bit on the, the functions of the theca and the granulosa. Um, I mentioned they produce hormones. Um, specifically, the theca is kind of comparable to the Leydig cell cells of the male in the sense that it responds to LH to make testosterone. So this is producing testosterone. And you might think, wait a minute, females make testosterone? Yes, females make testosterone, not as much as males. Males also make estrogen, not as much as females. All right. That testosterone, being that it's a lipid, right, it can cross the membrane very easily and it diffuses in the granulosa where it's converted into estrogen. And that conversion into estrogen is dependent upon FSH. So in addition to FSH stimulating growth of the follicle, it also helps to stimulate estrogen production. And the enzyme involved in that is called aromatase. Oops. Um, okay, this is just to continue. Yeah, because I only showed a few pictures right here. Um, so this is just talking about the growth from primary to secondary. Um, secondary becomes a mature follicle. Um, don't worry about the term corona radiata. It's not labeled here. It typically is the the follicular cells that surround an ovum that are left due to this antrum. This space that develops, if you're wondering, between the egg and some of the other areas is basically just a fluid-filled cavity that eventually builds up enough pressure inside, fluid-filled pressure, that is at least partly responsible for pushing or expelling the um, primary oocyte out of the ovaries. All right. So like I said, ovulation is at the end of the follicular phase. Here is the oocyte, now a secondary oocyte being ovulated. It's swept into the uterine tube. And I, I am using that term not loosely because the fimbria that are part of that infundibulum actually move and they help to pull the egg into the fallopian tube. Now here's another hormonal role. Remember I mentioned that FSH is responsible for follicular development as well as estrogen production? Well, LH, in addition to producing testosterone, its main role is stimulating ovulation. And if anyone is interested in like their, what stage of fertility they're in, going to the pharmacy, you can get those ovulation test kits. And what those test kits are measuring are levels of LH. As, as someone gets closer to ovulation, LH levels will spike, and that helps to trigger ovulation. All right, now let's enter into the luteal phase. Um, the luteal phase, of course, is associated with the corpus luteum, which secretes copious amounts of progesterone. Remember, up here, we're getting a lot of estrogen. Down here, more progesterone. 
progesterone kind of is, it has a synergistic effect with estrogen. Estrogen helps to build up the uterus, but the progesterone adds to that, and it helps to sort of increase the activity, the secretory activity of the um, endometrium. If no implantation of the egg occurs, excuse me, in the endometrium, the corpus luteum will regress, shrink, and progesterone levels decrease. That corpus luteum transforms into what's called a corpus albicans. It's not shown here. Um, this literally means white body. It turns more of a pale color. Progesterone levels will plummet, and then eventually, as we'll see soon, menstruation occurs and the cycle starts all over again. All right, this is really a summary of the ovarian cycle, um, showing the primordial follicles, the uh, primary follicles, secondary follicles with more layers of follicular cells. Um, this is what they're calling an antral follicle, which you can call a tertiary follicle, where you're seeing some of the fluid accumulate. And then we have this, which is known as the graphene follicle. Shortly thereafter, this A is expelled, and it is actually a forceful event. You could, I think, go onto YouTube. Some physicians have actually, uh, with cameras, been able to actually document the process of ovulation, where it's actually an explosive event, where the egg is expelled from the um, um, ovary. And then we have the corpus luteum. Professor? Yes. Um, for That's something that's kind of confusing. So sure. like the egg expels itself and then re-enters if it is fertilized in, like to the corpus. No, it doesn't. So the egg is released from the ovary and it travels down the uterine tube. Yeah. It's fertilized in the uterine tube. Now okay. what's left, what's expelled is just the egg all these follicular cells that surround it, they stay in the ovary. Oh, and then they become the corpus luteum. And they become the corpus luteum. Okay. Does, does, does that help? Yeah. And then okay. another question is, sure. I'm, um, this is interesting because, um, you know, I'm on birth control, so I always think about how the hormones are related. Uh -huh. And it's still kind of confusing how estrogen is related in the follicular phase. Like, is it uh -huh. to prepare the egg? or is it like preparing the uterus? You know? Okay, really good question. So estrogen has several roles. Number one, okay, so, um, and it will I, I've got some other pictures coming up that will show estrogen building up and what it does, but I'll just explain it now. Um, as the follicle grows, um, because you've got these follicular cells, estrogen levels get, um, levels go higher and higher and higher. What the estrogen is doing, it's doing a couple things. Estrogen is itself stimulating growth of the follicle. So if um, with FSH coming down, that's stimulating the production of estrogen, and estrogen is triggering in the transition into these different growth phases. So it has a direct effect on the growth there in the ovary. Mm -hmm. That same estrogen is also entering into the blood and, and reaching the uterus where it's actually helping to thicken the endometrium. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay. These are great questions. I know the reproductive system is more than any other of my lectures. It always is more, it also always elicits more questions. It just, it's just just very fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is kind of an overview of what we've come, and I'm going to combine a lot of this stuff. So at the very end, if you guys are like kind of all over the place right now with this, you're going to see on the same table what's going on in the ovary and the uterus. So hopefully it'll clarify it. Um, this is what we just looked at. These, this is the ovarian cycle where we have rough, roughly the first 14 days. Uh, you're seeing the development of follicles. And you can see of the developing follicles, really only one, sometimes two, grows, where you've got a bunch of them down here. They're selected. That selected one eventually ovulates, 
the egg is expelled, travels down the uterine tube. It's inside the ovary, we, the, those follicular cells transform into the corpus luteum. And this is what's making progesterone. The estrogen is being made, made here. Um, the, cor the luteal phase lasts for a while, um, but what ends it is if an egg is not fertilized. If an egg is fertilized, that's a whole other story, and we'll talk about that later, where the corpus luteum stays active for a good portion of the pregnancy because you want to keep the progesterone. If pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum decreases in size, shrinks, progesterone levels plummet, um, and then eventually we'll see events that are happening in the oh, uterus, but essentially the cycle starts all over again. Now we're gonna take a look at really the same time period, roughly the same time period as what's happening now in the uterus. Um, and the area we're gonna look at in the uterus is really specifically the endometrium, because that's really of the three layers, that's the one that has, is most greatly affected by the uh, menstrual cycle. It pretty much coordinates with the menstrual cycle. Uh, the endometrial phases are also directed by FSH and LH, pretty much by what, through the hormones that are produced in the ovaries. Okay, um, the uterine cycle consists of three phases. The first phase um, is sometimes, and it's kind of, kind of difficult. Actually, I'm gonna kind of word it differently, I think, to make it less confusing. Um, the, the same time, roughly, that the, that the follicular phase, that the eggs are starting to develop, that follicular phase, is what we call the proliferative phase in the uterus. As the, as the egg, as the follicles are starting to grow, estrogen is being produced, we're starting to see the functional, uh, the, the endometrium grow. Don't worry about kind of the slight shifting in days right now. I'm going to try to correlate it as best as possible. So this would be like the pre-ovulation time. Ovulation occurs. After ovulation in the ovary, we're in the luteal phase. The corresponding phase in the uterus is the secretory phase. Okay. Now, We'll talk a bit about the menstrual phase in, in just a little bit, but just think of the fact that at the end of the luteal phase in the ovary, remember when progesterone levels drop, that eventually leads to a shedding of the endometrium, and that's the menstrual phase. All right. So let me go through some of the hormonal aspects of, of, of what's going on in the menstrual cycle. And I wanna focus a bit on the pituitary, and then we're gonna come back and look at every single thing on one table. What's going on in the ovaries, what's going on in the uterus, and what's going on in the pituitary. Um, I mentioned the two hormones that are involved are LH and FSH, right? Um, what you see in blue here is the follicular phase. What you see here is the luteal phase. What you see right in the middle is ovulation. Now, what it doesn't show is that in the beginning, there's a little increase, it's kind of hard to tell, in FSH. That's followed by a little increase in LH. This slight increase in FSH is involved in development of the follicles. It can be a little bit confusing, this part. Uh, what I wanna really dwell on is this big event that occurs just prior to ovulation. We get a, it's a slight spike in FSH, which kind of finalizes the follicular development and the estrogen production. And this occurs simultaneously with a spike in LH. And this is what we call a, either a pre-ovulatory surge or pre-ovulatory spike of LH, this is what triggers ovulation. So like I said, the ovulation test kits that you can get in the pharmacy, they're measuring LH. Now while this is occurring in the pituitary, let's take a look what's happening in the 
ovary. And as I mentioned, you notice there's very little progesterone, right? There's really no corpus luteum for the most part. What we are start seeing is an increase in estrogen, right? Primarily due to an increase in FSH, right? We get a spike in estrogen. Following ovulation, look what happens. Now, certainly there is some estrogen, but I want to emphasize that the dominating hormone is progesterone due to the corpus luteum. The dominating steroid in the follicular phase is estrogen due to the role of the granulosa cells. All right. The last part, not any less important, is what's going on in the uterus. Now, if you take a look, we still have that blue and that, I don't know if you call it green, much like we did. You know, we call this follicular, we call this um, uh, luteal. Oops. Here we're going to call this follicular or proliferative, and we'll call this luteal, essentially. I'm going to start right here. Just it kind of makes it easier. Okay. As, as follicles start to develop under the influence of FSH, so everything is all connected. As FSH is being produced, follicles are developing. As the follicles are growing, we're seeing more estrogen being produced. Estrogen stimulates further growth of the follicles, but it also enters into the blood, travels to the uterus, and stimulates growth of that functionalis layer that stratum functionalis, you can see how it's thickening. These are, by the way, these are the spiral arteries, these little coiled things. So the uterus is starting to grow under the influence primarily of estrogen, okay? And, and continues to grow and grow, right, as estrogen peaks. Add ovulation, right, um, the corpus luteum forms, and we start to see the role of progesterone. Now progesterone, yes, estrogen had a major role on development, but really it's progesterone that has a massive um, ink effect on the endometrium and the, facts that, and the fact that it's, you see the development of these tubular glands. If you think of like the gastric pits in the stomach, right? These are these development of these glands, as well as the blood flow. Look at those arteries really developing. So if we think of the proliferative phase, which is primarily involved with really the growth of the endometrium in general, the secretory phase is primarily involved in the development of the glands. They start secreting substances like growth factors that are going to help and nourish the expected incoming embryo. If the embryo doesn't come, right, the corpus luteum decreases in, fun in, in um, activity, progesterone levels drop, and you can see the shedding of the endometrium that occurs during the menstrual phase. Now, a little bit later on, we start talking a bit about pregnancy. We're going to talk about why, what is it that, you know, the uterus is near the ovary, but it's not right next to it. How does the ovary know that the egg hasn't implanted? How do we know there's, how does it know there's no pregnancy? There happens to be a very important hormone that's produced when the egg implants, and we'll talk about that. This is what's called the pregnancy hormone. All right, so let's kind of summarize what's really going on at the uterus. Um, these are three photomicrographs showing in, sequ in succession the, what it looks like during the proliferative phase, where you've got the effects of estrogen stimulating the proliferation of the endometrium, some development of glands, but you know, in the development of, of spiral arteries. It's really the function of the glands, the activity, and you can actually see some material being secreted into the lumen of these glands. These really undergo further development under the effect of progesterone. If there's no implantation, progesterone levels drop. Those spiral arteries constrict, causing death of the 
endometrial cells. And of course, if you think about if those spiral arteries constrict, you've got all that blood behind them, eventually the pressure builds, the spiral arteries rupture, and that blood helps to carry out the, the endometrial tissue that is no longer, that, that died, that's no longer functional, carries that out with the menstrual flow. All right, so this is four for the price of one. This is everything together, the cyclical changes that are going on. And hold on a second, oops. So I'm not gonna go over everything in detail, but I am gonna kind of summarize it because you can, hopefully you can kind of see it. Um, first of all, let's draw a line down the middle. Everything in, to the left of the line is pre-ovulation. Everything to the left of the line is post-ovulation. These are the pituitary hormones. This are the ovarian events. These are the ovarian hormones. And this is, these are the uterine events. So as I mentioned, FSH levels go up at first, triggering development of the, of the follicle. That's what you see in, in blue. We get, to, and you can see the follicles are developing. Those follicles are producing estrogen. Estrogen causes some development of the uterus. Um, estrogen levels build up because the follicles are getting bigger. There's more fol follicular cells, more estrogen. Eventually, FSH spikes, which kind of finalizes the development of the follicle. Estrogen spikes, we get a further increase in um, the endometrium. <coughs> then we get a spike in LH. Spike in LH is the what we call the LH surge, which triggers ovulation, formation of corpus luteum, increase in progesterone. We start to see the glandular development of the endometrium. If no, if the egg isn't fertilized, the corpus luteum shrinks, progesterone levels drop. Without the the, the sustenance of progesterone the tissue dies, and this, this is followed by menstruation. So it's a very well, amazingly well-coordinated uh, mechanism. The last thing I wanna mention on the ovarian cycle before we actually start getting into events that are occurring if an egg is fertilized, is going back to the endocrine regulation. And because we've spoken so much about feedback, the semester, right? A lot of negative feedback. Um, negative feedback regulating blood pressure, glucose levels, right? Um, water levels decrease. We have produce a hormone, the ADH, which brings water in. So a lot of homeostasis, really homeostasis is dictated by negative feedback. Well, the female cycle has both negative feedback but primarily it's governed by positive feedback. Remember, positive feedback plays a role in childbirth, um, also blood clotting, right, um, and this ovarian cycle. So let's see how that's, this plays out. Here we have, again, left and right. On the right, we're looking at the follicular phase. On the left is the luteal phase, and in the middle, it's, well, in this case, ovulation or menstruation. So we're gonna kind of ignore that for now. Let's start from the beginning where we see an increase in FSH. FSH goes to the ovary and stimulates the production of estrogen. A form of estrogen is called estradiol. All right. Now, this is something we haven't spoken about, but it's really interesting. Um, Initially, the effects of estrogen, and I say initially because it's really early on, estrogen exerts a negative feedback on the pituitary. Now, exerts a negative feedback basically to ensure that there's, until the ovary, until the eggs develop further, we don't want to kind of trigger any ovulation. It's kind of a way of keeping things in check for a bit. So there's an initial negative feedback Eventually, once the follicles start getting bigger and bigger, estrogen at very high levels, so at low levels, estrogen exerts a negative feedback. 
as the follicles develop further and further, estrogen levels get very, very high. That as a, has a positive feedback, and this triggers the first the FSH surge and then the LH surge. So it's a positive feedback. The same hormone, and this is quite fascinating, the same hormone estrogen at low levels, negative feedback, high levels, positive feedback. It's because of that positive feedback that triggers the LH surge. Um, once we have the LH surge occurs, we have ovulation. We start to see an increase in progesterone production, right? Then, of course, if there is no fertilization, progesterone levels decrease, and then we start the cycle over again. Um, high levels of progesterone actually inhibits ovulation. And a good example of this, someone mentioned earlier about birth control pills. One of the things that's in birth control pills is progesterone. And progesterone basically does inhibit follicular development um, and um, yeah, primarily follicular development. So that's one, one aspect of progesterone is that it exerts an inhibitory role on egg development. Um, I wish we had time to go over the birth control effects because that's also very fascinating. So what do I want you to get out of this is that estrogen at low levels, negative feedback until the eggs get developed further and further. They're large enough. They're ready. They're, they're prime. Estrogen triggers that surge for ovulation. All right. So what we've talked, spoken about is what happens during the typical like non-fertile cycle, you know, assuming like a normal month-to-month -month menstruation. But what about if an egg is fertilized, right, leading to pregnancy, right? So now we're going to bring back the male reproductive system to kind of focus on the contributions and how this all works, right? So for pregnancy to occur, obviously we've got to have fertilization. There, so imagine sperm entering into the vagina, and in order for the sperm to fertilize an egg, two additional events have to occur. One is called the acrosome reaction, and one is called the cortical reaction, right? So of course, remember, with pregnancy, um, you have to have the acrosome, remember I mentioned produces enzymes, those enzymes have to be released that will eventually rupture the zona pellucida that'll give the sperm access to the egg. So that's number one, the acrosome reaction is an essential component for the sperm once it reaches the egg to be able to penetrate. If there's something wrong with the acrosome, the sperm might be very modal, might be swimming, might be otherwise functional, but if that acrosome is not working, there won't be any fertilization. The other event that occurs is really something that follows fertilization. And this is what, this is what prevents more than one sperm from fertilizing an egg. Once one sperm fertilizes an egg, Granules are, are, um, um, granules are released from the egg that create actually a barrier or a membrane, like a bubble that prevents other sperm from fertilizing an egg, right? This prevents polyspermy, and polyspermy can result in abortion. It would not allow for a viable egg because instead of having 23 chromosomes of a sperm plus 23 of an egg where you have 46, this would end up being 69 or even more. So this is not compatible. Okay, so two reactions, acrosome and cortical, right? And these are a couple pictures showing them. Um, this is the spermatozoa releasing the enzyme. This is all the zona pellucida right here, basically penetrating with those enzymes from the acrosome penetrating through, eventually getting through. Once the sperm gets into the egg, there are these, what's called the cortical reaction. It's kind of hard to tell here, but these 
little blue granules create a barrier that prevents any further sperm from getting in. So pretty fascinating stuff, reproduction. All right. All right, so an egg is fertilized. What happens next? All right, remember I mentioned an egg is fertilized primarily in the ampulla, right, of the ovary. This looks like it's a little bit further, but it's primarily in the ampulla. First thing that happens, of course, is that egg divides. I'm not going to go through any much in the way of embryology, but you should know that that one egg divides several times. Once it's fertilized, as it's traveling with the aid of the cilia and the muscle, into the uterus. And it takes roughly about four to five days for what's called now a blastocyst. So that fertilized egg, which is known as a zygote, remember it's now completed the second round of meiosis. It's now a zygote, travels down into the uterus. It's now called a blastocyst. And now it implants in the endometrium. Oops. So let's talk about implantation. So blastocyst begins implantation and into the endometrium. It takes roughly about, around day six is when it starts. I put down, it takes four to five days to reach the uterus. Implantation starts roughly around day six. Again, it varies a little bit. Um, what is a blastocyst? Well, a blastocyst con consists of two parts. We have what's called the um, inner cell mass which is going to form eventually the baby. And then we have what's known as the trophoblast, which is this layer, which is divided up into what's called the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast. Oh, that's a tongue twister. All I wanna mention at this point is that those two, they're gonna be involved in the formation of the placenta, whereas the inner cell mass is going to form the baby. It's also at this point where I want to mention the production of a hormone called HCG. This is the pregnancy indicator. So, you know, someone wants to know if they're pregnant, they get the pregnancy test kits. You know, if you see the line, that means pregnancy. What that is testing for is HCG. If HCG is present, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, I think there's some rare exceptions but that roughly I think it's up to 99% of the time someone's pregnant. The HCG is produced as this egg begins to implant, and that hormone travels to the uterus, I'm sorry, tra travels to the ovary, and it basically tells the, the corpus luteum to keep making progesterone. Keep making progesterone. Because we want progesterone to be maintained, we don't want the endometrium to be sloughed off right? You want it to stay there. All right. This is just another picture showing the process of implantation. There's the endometrium. And it eventually, even though it doesn't show it here, um, well, it does show it here, it's completely underneath the endometrium. Hey, Ryan. Right. What time is your meeting? Okay. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up here. I'm gonna wrap it up. Okay. All right. Um, sorry about that. I'm gonna do a couple more slides. My son just mentioned to me he's got a Zoom meeting with one of his classes. So at twelve thirty. So I'm gonna do a couple more slides and then I'm gonna stop and I'll finish it up on the, um, on uh, what I'm gonna, um, I'll go ahead and send the rest to you. Um, I did wanna mention here that normally eggs, when an egg is fertilized, it implants typically in the endometrium, but you can see in some circumstances, and I've only mentioned a few, it can plant, it can implant in several places in the fallopian tube, um, it can implant in the abdominal cavity, um, other areas as well. And this is what we call kind of an abnormal circumstance, which can be painful, um, and sometimes intervention has to take place. All right. So I'm going to go ahead 
apologize for this. I'm going to have to go ahead and stop. Um, what slide did we get up to? We got up to slide, let's say slide number 41. I'm going to record this. Obviously, I'm recording it. I'm going to finish the, net, the last nine slides along with the study guide, um, and I'll go ahead and post that as well. So um, sorry about that. Um, but anyway, hopefully this was helpful and I will see you guys on Thursday. And like I said, I'll go ahead and send out the, um, the two videos, this one, and then the, um, one where we're going to finish it and the study guide. All right. See you guys later.